Brother lads, welcome back to Costa Snow Podcast. My name is Costa. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in all parts of the world. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to a brand new video. Arsenal won, Monaco won, and Arsenal have won the game 5 4 on penalties. Arsenal have ended their pre season campaign, and now it's, fo- it's time for us to focus on the major silverware. However, there is something I want us to talk about in that game, and also something that has actually uh, manifested in our pre season, something that I don't like. The hardship that we go through to win games um, is actually a little bit concerning. Now, you will think about the Manchester United game, you'll think about the FC Nuremberg game, you'll think about this game against Monaco, and you'll think about, you'll, you'll go back to that um, major All Stars game that we won five, you know, by five goals. There is some, there is a degree of hardship that we are actually going through to win games that didn't exist uh, last season. And I want us to talk about that. But listen, Arsenal have retained um, the Emirates Cup. You know, Asen Wenger was there. Of course, he was going to be, um, you know, presiding over his, his statue and, you know, the official unveiling uh, of his statue. And we have the trophy back. Here are the five things we learned from this game. And my reaction to preseason as a whole. Who was your man of the match, by the way? Let me know in the comment box below. And what are your thoughts on that game? Now, first and foremost, uh, we saw Pat uh, Rice um, and Emil uh, Smith Ross start in the se- in, in in the same lineup. I think it's it's kind of an early indication that we will see Pat and Declan Rice uh, play a couple of times together. I want your thoughts here on Pate and Rice playing together because today it was uninspiring. Their combination was pretty much average to an extent that I I kind of felt like Declan Rice was not important on that pitch. He was not existent on that pitch. My problem with Rice and Pate playing together is one will have to take on the more advanced roles of um, of Granny Jacker, the ones he put, you know, the ones he t- took on last season. Um, one would love to play more like Leandro Trossard or Kai Havers. I don't think Thomas Pate is that, and I don't think Declan Rice is that as well. Yes, we've been convinced that he's that kind of player that has got that, you know, technical ability in his locker. But today, that kind of pivot really didn't work for me. And not because we didn't dominate games enough, the game enough. It's not because um, Arsenal were actually outplayed. That is not true. We, we really played very well in midfield. Thomas Partey was very vibrant. Um, you could see him winning the ball back. He was, you know, fighting 1v1 with uh, Yusuf Fofana. It was actually a very interesting battle between Partey and Fofana. My problem with Rice, you know, in that system is... We give his responsibilities to Thomas Partey. Rice is a very good player. Progressively, he carries the ball very well. He will break the first line of defense um, or the first line of press for the, uh, of the opponent. But he's not your Kai Havers. He's actually not your uh, Leandro Trossard. So my thoughts and opinions on that double, on that duo playing together, is unless it is too necessary, unless we play Man City, unless we play uh, Liverpool, and the roles must be clearly defined. Pate and Rice, it doesn't look like there is a future there. It doesn't look like they will be playing together um, in, in a more attacking formation, like we saw last campaign, Arsenal, with, with that, that, that kind of free-flowing football. I mean, th- there might be questions of Rice, is it taking a little bit longer uh, to settle in? I've seen Kai Havers a little bit, you know, getting better. Even in this game when he came, came in, I could see the runs, I could see the connection between him and Martin Odegaard in that midfield. There is a connection. He's actually starting to come around. But I, I think we will give Decker some time. But for now, that partnership between Pate and Rice, we've seen it for the first time. I'm not going to over-criticize it. I just didn't like what I saw when we played with them. The second observation is that Fabio Vieira played 90 minutes and he actually played where Saka is supposed to play. He played on the, on that right wing and uh, that is where he's supposed to play. I'm not saying he had a very good game, Fabio. I think he, he was pretty much average as compared to the technical guy I know, as compared to the Fabio Vieira I expect to see this season. But I, I think we are going to see more of Vieira 
on the right hand side i think we'll see him being interchanged with uh bukayo saka is gonna be, be become our bernardo silva he will give us that be, be bernardo silva kind of vibe right that kind of midfielder that um links up with the midfield but then stretches out wide i, I love it i really really do and what we've seen with fabio vera today in this game against monaco is he literally had all that space ahead of him to run into and he also had a lot of time on the ball to you know to do whatever he wants you know in those wide areas in those um areas far, far away from goal and far away from the midfield that are not actually very congested fabio Vieira is such a very very good player now i think he needs to work on his game a lot especially on the physical side i'm not saying he needs to be massively physical all i'm saying is that I don't think it's there yet. I don't think that's the best of Fabio Vieira. There is something lacking. But it's, 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 it's a very, very courageous point uh, from Mikel Arteta to go, I will give you 90 minutes and I'll give you a penalty as well. And I think Mikel must be a little bit impressed. He's, he's confident. Uh, I think that is one thing that um, Fabio Vieira has never been short of. He's never been short uh, of confidence. So he's a very, very confident player. And he's one of the players that I think Arsenal can back on um, and, you know, trust next season. So Fabio Vieira on that right-hand side, it looks like even if we don't sign in anyone, we have a player who can actually be interchanged with Bukayo Saka once in a while. The third observation is actually a little bit cruel, but um, I'm used to be cruel, right? We need a striker. We need a finisher. This might not come this summer. This must not be. This might, I'm not saying Arsenal should go out in the market right now um, and sign a number nine. I'm saying it should be on the priority for Arsenal on the next transfer uh, transfer summer. Like it's it's a no brainer. We need. A striker. So I, I, I looked at the couple of chances that Edin Ketia himself created for himself and he missed, and the couple of chances that was create were created for him and he missed them. And I'm like, you have a good number nine there. You don't struggle to win games. And I'm going to talk about the struggle to win games that I, we, we've seen in this preseason and the kind of disorganization which is um, actually a result of Mikel Arteta overthinking and over tinkering with um uh, with the system but i think eddie is um eddie's a good fringe player eddie's a very good squad player so it doesn't hurt for you to have three good strikers eddie being one of them gabriel Jesus maybe being the other and if we could add a player like ivan tony to the side he would be absolutely amazing now he will not be, be playing any football until january the 17th I think it's all right. I just think it's all right. I just think if Arsenal can get him out of the door, uh, sorry, through the door, not um, out of the door, but uh, through the door, get that deal done. It might be a game changer. It might be a season changer uh, for us this coming season. So, Gabriel Jesus is actually has, has picked up an injury. It's one of those, um, you know, crazy, uh, you know, crazy times. Right, he picked up an injury during the World Cup, and we thought he would be back sooner than later. He did take his time. He came back. He was on fire, and now he's had. He's got a same pro a similar problem in a similar area in his knee. I think Arsenal need to think about it. We really, really need to um, consider our options. Either we trust Eddie Nketiah and he becomes our full-on striker, or we sign a good striker. If Jesus is going to battle with that um, knee injury, trust me, Arsenal will need a very, very good number nine. We will need a very good number nine. And it has been very, very key um, <clears throat> in this game. The amount of chances that our players have been running onto. I looked at Leandro Trossard running through on goal and there was no player that um, he could instinctively think about to square that ball for. And the amount of times that Edin Keta will get through on goal and the amount of times he will make that ball cross the line is very, very indicative that Arsenal need a serious striker. If, if everyone is signing... A proper number nine. If Man United are signing Rasmus Holland, if um, Chelsea are signing uh, Jackson and Kunku, every single club now has a player that has that ability to give you 25 goals and above. I think in Kunku, Chelsea have that player. In um, 
in Darwin Nunes, Liverpool have that player. In Haaland, City have that player. Rasmus Holland and, and, and Rashford, one of them can give you 25 and above um, a campaign, right? I think it's only Newcastle and Arsenal that are being left out. Of course, Spurs, um, with, you know, Ceteris Paribas, they still have Harry Kane, which is actually um, a very, very huge boost if they can keep him. So Arsenal will need that striker. We will need that number nine. Observation number four. Our squad depth has massively improved. So if you look at this team that started against Monaco, it's a team that actually played... Um, uh, it's a team that has not played together for quite some time. So Ramsdale was in goal. He's a starter. But Jakub Kivio is not a known starter uh, in, you know, in that position. Timba has not been a starter for us. Uh, Saliba is a starter. But... Um, um, uh, um, the rest of the other guys, in, especially in midfield, um, have not been starters. Emil smith Bro, Fabio Vieira, Eddie Nketiah. So I, I think our squad depth is, 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 a, is a point we talked about so much last season, so much about last season, that um, if Arsenal want to get anywhere close to Manchester City, they need to get that squad depth. We need to get those players that can uh, compete Per position. I don't think it's about having two players per position. It's about having players that can have that extra versatility and they can give you two different teams um, at any point in time. I think we've actually seen that. Odega didn't start. Kai Havers didn't start. Trossard didn't start. Um, uh, Saka didn't start. So it's, 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 it's a deep. Gabriel Magalis didn't start, Zichenko was not in the team, and Ben Watt was not in the team. So we, we, we literally played our second 11 first, and then we also brought in almost another 11 um, in the second half. This is going to be very crucial to how us to line up in all competitions next season. So the Carabao Cup and why Manchester City have won so many, have won so many Carabao Cups um, over the last decade. The reason is easy. Most of the clubs actually take the Carabao Cup as a youth tournament. I don't think Manchester City are any different. What Manchester City have done actually is they have created three quality 11s. One 11 wins you the Carabao Cup. The second 11 win you, wins you the um, DFA Cup or probably takes you as far as it can to the FA Cup and the UEFA Champions League. And the first 11 has always been the title winning uh, 11. So I think Arsenal are slowly getting there. If we can get David Dreyer, those are two goalkeepers. Our backline is sorted in terms of first choice and second choice. Our midfield is sorted in terms of first choice and second choice, apart from Martin Odegaard. Today I saw Emil Smith Pro um, play in that position. We're going to talk about him a little bit, but I was not contented. So the squad depth is coming around. The squad is actually, you know, we're building the squad in a very effective way and you can see that it has already started taking shape you know if we can get a striker one good one we get a player who can give us the martin odegaard um effect because with odegaard you have a game controller you have a player who dictates the temper of the game and you also have a creator so we need such a player desperately all right so that is another thing that um that's another thing that uh we saw in this game the last two points, actually very, very uncoordinated, but um, I would love to, to put them in one paragraph. One is Emil smith Rowe is back on the pitch. It's very good to see him. Now, he didn't play where he, he loves to play. And of course, it's going to happen a lot of the time. We've seen Julian Timba play at left back. We've seen Jakub Kivio play at right center back um, in the second half of that Monaco game when... Uh, Saliba was actually withdrawn. So we are, we are going to see a lot of tweaks and changes from Mikel Arteta. But it's very good to have Emil smith Rowe back in the team. He is our number 10, for Christ's sake. And he's such a very talented footballer. Like, you can see the effort and you can see what he does. He's so, so gifted and he's very, very talented. So I don't think he's going to be replacing uh, uh, Odegaard. 
I don't think he should be replacing Odegaard. I think he should be replacing Kai Havers. He should be fighting with Kai Havers for that position. And I think Mikel Atta will eventually understand that. But um, I really did love Emil. I really loved to, to see him. And I, I really love to see him back on the pitch to playing some good minutes and also having that kind of effect on the game. But my final point, and this is generally uh, throughout, um, throughout our preseason, we look uncoordinated, we look not ready, we look lost. This preseason was supposed to be the point where we get everything right. Like, Last season, we got so many things right. So this preseason was literally what I thought we would. It's where where I it's where I thought we would get so many things right. It has actually not come out in that way. I kind of feel like we are struggling to win games. I feel like we are. Our goals are far fetched. I don't know if you guys also feel that way. You look at that Edin Ketia goal. And then you look at the other chances that we had. The Trossard chance, which was really good. Edin Ketia also had another chance. Gabriel Martinelli had another, uh, another chance. But the chances are there. But it, it, it doesn't feel like we're going to score any moment. I don't know whether it's, it's the number nine effect or it's just preseason. I hope it's just preseason. But let me know your thoughts generally on preseason because I will be doing a full analysis on our preseason later on.